Wooster, Wooster, are you still with us? Hello? 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 Hello
and I was uh, honored by the president to accompany her as one of the three people in that forum, which was held in the trusteeship council and opened by the Secretary General of the United Nations and addressed by Bill Gates and Warren Buffett, all these people, and uh, including billionaires from Africa, from uh, Mosepi, Patrice Mosepi and his wife from South Africa, um, you know, uh, you know, from Nigeria, the uh, rich and wealthy from Nigeria were also there. So it wasn't only uh, European wealthy people or uh, Anglo-Saxon wealthy people. It included Africans who were committed to tr- to supporting philanthropy in the world. Um, of course, uh, I'm still here among other things, to meet with librarians uh, because I, my office is responsible for the diaspora, issues of diaspora, and of philanthropy. So I've been working on issues of diaspora, and we, our office, the specific unit in my office is being set up at the moment to deal with concerns of Liberian diaspora, wherever they may be. So that tells the story of why I'm here. And, of course, um, uh, I was able to um, uh, participate and uh, honor my son, who was graduating from high school. And and then by the weekend, I'll be for Dr. Sawyer's mother's funeral in Maryland. So that tells the full story, as I said, of my presence in the United States and we'll be returning back to continue working in Monrovia. Um, having said that, for the topics that you think that we'll talk about, I'm sure most of what we should do will come from the questions and comments from the floor to, to, to encourage a free flow of the discussion. But I should say, however, that Liberians should be very proud that this year, August 18, will mark the 10th year since the signing of the Comprehensive Peace Agreement. This is the 10th year in many, many years, as you say, since 1979, that Liberians carry on for a decade without armed violence of one form or the other. Do you remember after 1979, with the rice riots. Uh, one year later was the coup d'etat, and during the 10 years of the military com, uh, civilian rule of President Samuel Do, um, there was hardly any year that would pass without one form of uh, uh, armed violence linked to attempted coup or attempt to remove the president by force or some form of armed violence. And then we saw in December of 1989, the beginning of the most sustained, most brutal, uh, most devastating armed violence in the life of our country. Uh, that was ended on two, in the signing of the Comprehensive Peace Agreement on August 18 in Accra uh, in 20. Or three. So we have a reason as Liberians to celebrate that we've been able, in spite of the challenges that we face, in spite of all of the trials, we've been able to hold our country together for 10 solid years without any armed or sustained armed violence of any sort. There have been people angry with each other. There are people some things have happened and somebody got killed, or, but it was never a sustained, organized armed violence. There may be armed robbery here and somebody may have gotten wounded, but that's not the same as a sustained armed violence. So we have reason to, be, to celebrate. Our children who were born in the last 10 years, for so the first time, we now have children who started school and have gone to primary school knowing only peace 
without having to run from one uh, spot to another. So that's, that's the point I, I will hope we'll keep in focus. And what can we then do to ensure that we continue to consolidate that peace, ensure that it's sustained, ensure that the benefits of peace become manifest in economic growth and development, in, on, in employment opportunities, for all of our citizens, especially the youth and, um, you know, our training institutions, our educational institutions will prosper and, and, and all of those things that we call the dividends of peace begin to be manifest. Um, the other comment I would make quickly is about the debate on the uh, on dual citizenship and and the issues all connected with it. I think that, you know, I think that maybe the, the emotive part of this debate is the name that it is called. Once people hear dual citizenship, the tendency is for people to start saying, oh, you know, you want to eat, have your cake and eat it too. But I think the key issues is what exists in the law that makes it difficult or that threatening Liberians legitimate citizens of our country from benefiting in the benefits of our country. For example, the key part of the law that talks about the citizen of Liberia, one has to be a citizen of Liberia to own land in Liberia. I think that is very critical to all of this. Dual citizenship or no dual citizenship. Even without dual citizenship, if Liberians could, if one could own land, if one could own land without necessarily being a citizen, we wouldn't have all this debate. But I think people have a right to question anything that is going to deprive them of benefiting from their, their birthrights. You know, anything that would deprive people from participating in the development of their country that they've contributed to, uh, whose uh, development that they've contributed so much to, you know, whether their parents or themselves. And so by one single expression to define all of the conglomeration of things by the term dual citizenship, it becomes very emotive. And so people can cease to listen to what it means, what the, uh, the advocates are saying. Because I support the right of Liberians, wherever they may be, to still have a stake in their country. Because Liberians, wherever they have been, in our most difficult times, contributed to sustaining our country, making sure that that country remains and continues to grow, to live on this face of the earth, wherever they have been. And therefore, the benefits therefrom, they must, be, they must uh, partake. They cannot be denied any uh, participation because of a thing that, is, that appears to be a stigma, because they're taking on a citizenship in another country, you know, uh, for reasons that, you know, I, I don't even want to go into. So these are my opening remarks on the topics that were introduced on the program. If there's something else that I left out, please let me know. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Usa. Uh, you've spoken well, and uh, I do want to thank you profoundly for coming on the show, especially uh, while on the highway. That's got to be uh, a serious commitment to speaking with your people, uh, even on the, ro on the road. Now, yeah. since you've told us where you are, uh, it is perfectly understandable that sometime doing this, uh, discussion uh, as you drive through uh, uh, over bridges and under bridges that it's possible the line will drop if that happens uh, now we know why he's on the road he's not at, uh, at a specific location so that's what will happen now you found the minister well and i've opened up your question line so if you have any question comment or concern at this time and uh, now will be the time to dial star six one on your phone and then we'll open up your line so that you may have a say 
Now, as always, I'd like to begin the question. And before I take the first caller for the night, I'd like to ask the minister about uh, the issue of 10 years of peace, sustained peace in Liberia. Uh, that issue has been brought up before on this very show, but uh, unfortunately, many of us in the diaspora like to credit that more to the foreign peacekeepers, uh, the international troops, uh, UN uh, uh, forces, uh, rather than to Liberians. And I don't know if you agree with that session, but there's this notion that uh, the, the peace in Liberia that we're now boasting about is mostly due to the presence of our good friends and you know, other people that are there to help us do so. And so my question is, what do you think will happen now that there, there's, there's a drawdown of UN forces? What happened when the last UN troop, last UN soldier or police officer leave Liberia? Will we still be able to have the peace that we're now bragging about, sir? Well, the first point, I'm very strong of the view that people like the of Liberians have realized that it is important for their own well being that they are free. No one can just go and tell you to stop fighting when you are not ready for it. I mean, for those of us who are married or those who come from families where there is some confusion. No matter what the parents say, no matter what French government say, people involved in that conflict must realize, they have to realize that they are not going any far in their life unless they end the peace. The others who come in are to assist you realize the benefits of peace. But they cannot make peace for you. The peace must be with yourself. You must feel it. And I think this is what Liberians felt. After 14 years of doing the worst of each other, we've done everything wrong with each other. And people realized that they were not going anywhere with this type of behavior. You know? And they began to say, now we need a peace. That is why the negotiation in Accra, nobody put a gun at anybody's head. To agree to sign the company that entered into it. We sign it of our own accord. Having signed it, then we said, in order to assist us get there gradually, we needed the help of, uh, we said we needed the help of our friends. And the international community that helped us in the negotiation process itself began to play a role. In that, in that role by sending to peace. So the drawdown, whether we have the drawdown or not, I think the thing that is important for each and every one of us is that we prepare to maintain that peace and nobody, absolutely nobody, has the right to take it away from us. No one has any right to get angry on behalf of the Liberian people to start anything that would lead to uh, sustain violence. You know, so uh, if we have that kind of spirit, then the peace people can lead the goal. That is why we are training our own people. Liberians will have to manage their food affairs. The same police officers we don't like very much, we have to learn to work with them until they get better. That is our country. Those who are here, who are in Liberia helping us, do not come from perfect country. They come from systems that also have some difficulties. So, so we cannot just sit and believe that they will be there forever. That would, that would be my response to the, the comment. Thank you. Thank you. I'll take the first caller for the night. You, you were kind of sounding very low, Minister uh, Wilson. I don't know if, uh, if it's a telephone or it's the part of the role you're on right now, but we could barely hear the last few things you said, but that's fine. I'll take the first caller for the night. And uh, may I remind you, the audience, that uh, the Honorable Minister is going to be a force for a very uh, limited period of time. It's not going to be like uh, most of our previous guests. We did talk about that. We had other prior engagement. And so please keep your questions brief and uh, uh, perhaps one question at a time and keep it brief so that we can accommodate uh, all of you who want, who have things to say. 
Uh, I'll take the first caller, 1973-1373. Your name, where you calling from, and your question for Minister Hussein, sir. Yes, Brother Kuma, thank you for taking my call. This is Seyong Yawana from Brooklyn Park, Minnesota. Welcome to yes, the uh, uh, for, yeah. So Thank you, sir. Uh, our political reserves. Let me just speak you back quickly on the question of uh, 10 years of in job peace. I think it's fair to say that we are all grateful that we can hear from our honorable minister that the country is enjoying 10 years of peace. But I also like the fact that you also brought in the fact of the fallen troop. But my question here now is, is it a sound to tell us that with this in job peace, there isn't a need for us to talk about the implementation of a TLC, or can we sustain this in job peace with the implementation of a TLC report? Because let me close. I strongly believe that many others, first, I'm very grateful that today the TRC report is taking root amongst Liberian lawmakers, people talking about it. But it's the Honorable Minister suggesting that uh, in the absence of the implementation of the TRC report, can we sustain this in job peace? Thank you for taking my call. Thank you, Mr. Sir. Well, let me just quickly say um, maybe we need to know about what is called. Uh, we, we can barely hear you, uh, Minister. So we can barely hear you. Sorry, you, you say you can hear me? Yeah, this is much better. It's much better now, yeah. It's much better now. Okay, all right. No, I just wanted to say regarding the issue of uh, implementation of the TRC report. Now, um, I'm one of those who believe that there's a great deal of work being done in the implementation of the TRC report. And I I know that one of the key issues of the implementation has had to do with talking about the, our Liberian history, to review the Liberian history. Uh, recently, the a, a history conference was launched, and there were top-notch Liberian professional historians, uh, professors who came together uh, to start that process, uh, to launch what has already, uh, has already started. That was one of the recommendations of the TRC. Uh, there are a number of other things, the reform in the judicial, the judicial system, the issue of, uh, you know, just name them. There are a number of things that have been implemented. I would be interested if there were any specific part of the TRC report that uh, the caller would like to refer to that he thinks needs to be implemented in order to sustain the peace. You know, but otherwise, I think a lot of progress has been made, and um, you know, uh, you we should also keep in mind that the TRC process was just one of the many things that were meant to be done as part of the peace agreement to ensure the success of uh, implementing that agreement. So, um, you know, I and I think. In 10 years, what has been happening has been implementing the agreement, and therefore the successes that we have attained is a mark of the, the genius of uh, Liberians and their commitment to, to that agreement. Thank you. If you just yeah. join us, we'd like to welcome you to the Liberian Diaspora for a uh, weekly talk show, special edition, if I may add. Uh, tonight we have the privilege of hosting the Honorable Minister of uh, Minister of State with our portfolio, and we're coming to be with a, a very known political figure in Liberia. Uh, we'll take the next caller. Uh, if you have any question or comment or concern, again, please dial star 61. Keep the questions coming. We'll take the next caller for the night, uh, 3861, 3861. Would you please tell us your name, where you're calling from, and your question for Amber Wuse? 3861. Uh, my name is, hello, can you hear me? Yeah, you. Go ahead. Okay, I'm Harris C. Mann from Minnesota, Richfield. Uh, I, I, have, I have two simple questions for Honorable Wizard. Uh The first one, Honorable Wizard, what have you done as an experienced and educated uh, member of the society? What have you done 
regarding the um, the dual citizenship situation that is currently being discussed in Liberia, because we are hearing all kinds of derogatory remarks about this stuff. It's like people are not interested. Second, second question quickly is. On the line of Liberians who are qualified and leaving to go home, why are the people on the ground are so much derogatory towards people who want to plan to go buy home to help their own country? I don't understand it. And I wanted a vacation. I've been here 28 years. I want to go home as an educator. But, I, I, you know, I get discouraged. So I, I, I'll let you come in, sir. Thank you. And remember, when I went back, I held you in 1978. I remember you. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Harris. Well, thank you. Uh, that, uh, on the first issue, I think I started with the issue of this uh, dual citizenship. Dual citizenship. Yes, I did. think, and when you, back, your question was, what have I done? What I have done is um, I'm one of those, like I told you, in my office, there is a special department set up by the government, which is called the Diaspora affairs department within the office of the Minister of State with our portfolio. We've been able to raise some money from the World Bank and there will be an advert on the on the newspapers that are ex Liberians with the qualification uh to apply for. I think it should be on this week, you know, uh, so there will be a diaspora advisor there will be a project manager for that project, um, and they will be reporting to me. Now, one of the things that they should be doing is just dealing with all of the concerns of Liberians in the diaspora because we consider the diaspora as the 13th county of Liberia, and the diaspora has contributed immense contribution to the develop, development of our country. Now, having said that, I have said that maybe, you know, a lot of uh, thinking need to go into this matter as to the approach. I have said very clearly, and your delegation, the diaspora, and um, the, the uh, dual citizenship campaign delegation that went home, that was led by uh, Mr. Wetsy and, and, uh, and Mr., you know, and some of the other a gentleman, Mr. Kony, and others from Ghana, they met with me. I arranged meetings with them uh, for them to meet with the president and the date. I participated in the meeting. The view of the president was very clear. The views in general quarters of the government, in the cabinet that is, very clear that we do not want to do anything to stop any Liberians to contribute to the development of our country. That a Liberian has gone into some country and taking up citizenship should not deny them the, or deny the country what those people have to offer to the development of our country. Because even without a clear statement about dual citizenship, Liberians, wherever they have been, have made huge contributions to what we have, to the peace that we now have, to sustaining that peace, and to the overall development of the country. So that's our general position. The question now is an approach. What approach do we need to be able to deal with this matter in the legislature? If the more we think about it, and, and when the president was speaking with the Delegation. One of the things she said, look, let us remove emotion. It's, it's, it's not enough to just say, you know, give us dual citizenship because, you know, that our country too and this and that. There are other ways that this thing can be approached. In the United States, for example, there is no dual citizenship. I mean, the country doesn't recognize officially dual citizenship. But they have not kicked anybody out because they went to Israel and took on any responsibility in Israel and come back to the United States to do whatever. Or a Ghanaian who left from here and is a Ghanaian and came back 
and was carrying out his duties in in, in Ghana was not denied that right because they had become citizens of the United States. Now, in Liberia, without necessarily, you know, if that emotion will cause it, then let's deal with the things that make us afraid of a clear, of not having a clear law giving us dual citizenship. So I'm dealing with the issue of land, the issue of people who think you're going to compete for certain positions with them. If we de- de- um, uh, uh, segregate, we, we, we break up these uh, concerns and address them through legislation, we probably will have this thing go faster than it is at the moment. But I want to just say, I think that Liberians have a right to contribute to the well-being of our country, no matter what other citizenship they may have taken on for one reason or the other. Because I think Liberians, in their flesh, love their country, and they will want to be Liberians, wherever they may be. So that's my position, and the point is how we work together to make this thing happen so we get the appropriate legislation. Because, again, democracy says, that we must use our legislature to get some things done. In doing so, I do not think that anybody has the right to say anything derogatory about Liberians outside our country who are making so much contribution. The other question about jobs, in 28 years abroad, you have a certain qualification, you have a certain experience, you want to come home. My friend, I want to let you know that you do not need anybody's approval to go to Liberia. When you get ready and you want to go, you go. And the things and the skills you have, people will buy that skill. If you are a good mechanic, when you go home, no matter what anybody noise, anybody making a corner, set up your shop and you start repairing cars and see whether they will go to you or not. That's what I would tell you. If you walk also and you say, just because you spent 28 years in America and therefore you are entitled to certain things, then sorry for you. You will, be, you will frustrate yourself because there is no special entitlement for you. Every Liberia has a right to be there to enjoy certain, I mean, the privileges that the law provides. So you will have to compete with everybody. With your 28 years, if you don't have proper education, you will be on the roadside like anybody else. You'll be as unemployed as the other guy who has been in Liberia all his life. So just organize yourself well. Carry your tool, your trade, your, your qualification, your experience, and that will be the thing that people will buy. That's all I have to say about that. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Minister. I've noticed so many of you have just joined us within the last few minutes. Uh, I do want to welcome you to a very special edition of the Liberian Diaspora Forum Weekly Talk Show. We are very honored tonight to host Honorable Komini B. Wusa, Minister of State, uh, with our portfolio. Uh, so if you're just joining us, we are speaking on several issues of national concern, dual citizenship, 10 years of sustained peace in Liberia, uh, as well as uh, security in Liberia. So if you have any question, comment, or concern, by all means, please dial star 61, and we will open up your line. Let's take a follow-up question from Barasea Yewle uh, on the TRC report. Uh, Barasea, welcome back to Lebanon Diaspora Forum. Your follow-up question quickly, sir. Yes, uh, thank you, Barasea. Yes, Yes, uh, the Honorable Minister asked you know, for one suggestion or so that, that will be specific to implementation. Uh, one suggestion will be the TRC recommendation call for prosecution of those who were found uh, to commit uh, the most serious crime in Liberia, in addition to the 30 years then. These are the two major issues that are driving the debate over the TRC report. And these, uh, 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 these recommendations, to my knowledge, have not been even discussed, whether in public or among lawmakers, let alone we haven't seen any tangible 
movement towards that. And let me close on there with additional question quickly. What is the uh, minister's own role vis-a-vis -vis that of the foreign minister? Because there's some saying that almost like he's the de facto foreign minister. So can he comment on that? What's the difference between his role and that of the foreign minister? Thank you, sir. All right, let me start with the last part of your question. Um, the foreign minister is a gentleman I respect very much who has, a, who has statutory responsibility. In fact, for me to perform the role that I did at the United Nations to sign the Arms Trade Treaty, it was a foreign minister who signed the full powers of authority as is required on behalf of the president of Liberia. So we work very closely together. The, the job of the minister of state with our portfolio by law is the job that has, it, it says simply to assist the president effectively administer the affairs of state. That is the work of the Minister of State Without Portfolio. So in that position, when the President and the Foreign Minister, in this particular case, are both very busy somewhere and they cannot carry out a certain function, they ask me to do it. And they can ask somebody else, but in this particular case, they ask me. So I have great respect for the Foreign Minister. We work very closely together on a number of issues. And I, 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 I think uh, he's doing a good job so far. Now, the issue of um, the issue of um, uh, of the PRC and the the, the, the issue of um, banning people from holding office for 30 years and prosecutions and all of that. The we have to understand that the TRC recommendations were not the Constitution of Liberia. Keep that in mind. Maybe I need to give you my credentials on this issue. When we were writing the Comprehensive Peace Agreement in Accra, I played a role in, carve, in crafting what we now call the TRC section of the, of the uh, Peace Agreement. And then when we're in the transitional legislature, it was my committee, the Committee on the Peace Process and National Reconciliation, that I chaired, that wrote the law that you call the TRC law. In no part of that law was the TRC given any powers to do anything beyond what was provided for in the Constitution. So, the Constitution of Liberia said due process. You don't put people's names down. Just put people's names down. In some cases, they never even talked to any of some of the people. They never. There were several people who the matter was even taken to the Supreme Court. And it was proven that they didn't talk to the people. They just put their names down and say, ban for 30 years and go and you're charged with uh, carrying out the most grievous and heinous crimes. There was a case of Jew missing. Nobody ever called him. He never appeared before anybody. There was a case of um, of um, of uh, uh, um, Williams, Archie Williams, whose name was appeared and who took it to the Supreme Court. And if you if you have the patience to read the Supreme Court opinion about the TRC report specific to this issue. It shows that the TRC acted out of order. And as a person who wrote the law, who know the background to the law, who participated in all of the meetings, who chaired it and, pro uh, uh, and promoted it. And I was very sad that the TRC colleagues, our friends on the, on the thing, went out of their order in the things that they did. Respect to those recommendations. The law says that you, before you can do something like that, you must take them to court. You should put them on trial. Due process means they must have, they must be accused, and they must be, they must face the accusers. Who were the accusers of some of the things that they say the people did? So by 
putting into place something that was totally outside the Constitution. They themselves defeated the implementation because they cannot be implemented. You know, anyone who attempt to implement that part of it was going to be working outside the Constitution. So when I hear people just say the implementation, I want to ask you, tell me how, in what place were you going to implement this thing? If the person say what you say about me is not true, you got the witnesses, you got yourself to go, you will prosecute them. You will, I mean, that was, it did not happen. Then 30 years, what part of the law in Liberia says that you can ban somebody from participating in political processes just like that by a whip, you know, by a whisk, and you say, you get go to the 30 years, you will not take in government. What power you got to do that? What is it? What is your standing to do that? So when I hear people just talk, it just amount to talking, you know. And if we, who are the educated ones, cannot, when we fought for human rights, we said that human rights was for everybody, the high and the low. So it could be for anybody. The only thing I call for is follow the due process. Is there anything in the TRC practice that was consistent with due process, you know, in the, case, the examples I just gave you? So that's all I have to say. Otherwise, the TRC recommendations, many have been wonderful. And it, it, it wasn't to be said also, I mean, it wasn't said at all in the law that whatever the TRC said was just it and nothing else. If you saw, it says the TRC, the matters of the TRC were going to be passed on to the Human Rights Commission, the Independent Human Rights Commission. The Independent Human Rights Commission, because it's a Human Rights Commission, anything it feels is contrary to uh, human rights, as they have not taken it up. So are you saying they too don't have any sense? They don't know their work? It's not the president. It's not anybody. It's an independent body that is doing its work. So they're taking on the issues that they, that, that they find consistent with law. That's all I have to say on this one. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Minister. Uh, for next week, our next week's show will be hosting Councillor Jalo. Uh, he just returned from Liberia on the scene. Uh, a citizenship issue. Uh, it will be our regular programming day Sunday, uh, same time. Councillor Jarlan, who hosts our fellow Liberian lawyers, will be uh, our guest next week. Do to do to uh, call him. In the meantime, we have from our community B with us. Uh, with us still, if you have any question, comment, or concern, by all means, please dial star six one. I do have a few test message questions here. Let me take a, a few of those, and then we will get back to you on the line. Keep your questions coming. Star six one. I will say I have a test message question from one Paul. Uh, his concern has to do with rampant corruption and nepotism, with specific reference to Ellen Johnson's uh, 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 children having multiple jobs, while uh, many qualified Liberians don't have any. Uh, your views on those co on those questions, sir. corruption and nepotism. On the issue of corruption, uh, Honorable nepotism, I think that. It is a very serious issue. Uh, it is one of those issues that um, the, we as a country have not been able to do our, to complete our part of due diligence. At the moment, we have a general law regarding um, nepotism, reference to nepotism and all of that. In the other countries that we, we like, like in the United States, they, it is defined what is meant by nepotism. What is the scope of nepotism? Who does it cover? In the United States, it is very extensive. And it went to that level after JFK appointed his brother, Robert, as Anthony General of the United States. Then the debate carried on and on and on, and they suspected it to include all manner of people related to uh, certain leaders in the government. 
in our country, we do not have that. It hasn't been done yet. So we make general statements that it is bad. And one of the things, like someone said, um, when reference is made to the president, is because um, the president, in the book that she wrote, and in the years of, uh, in the years, uh, in the top of years, she made references that were generalized. And I guess people decided to hold on to it, you know, and using that, uh, that generalization. But what we should do, and some of us are doing, is encouraging our legislature to be able to do the appropriate legislation as required to define the scope and content of the issues of, uh, of nepotism. Uh, it, it is not happening. And so it becomes, uh, we jerry pick. So we find, we find the president's son, chairman of the board, and so uh, he, he say he's, uh, I mean, he's called advisor, so a big job, and so that's nepotism, you know, or something else. Or the president's son who had been in the banking system all his life, from the time he came from school in the finance business. That's all you've been doing. In the government, he became president of the Housing and Savings Bank, and he's at a central bank. He's been, he was way in the central bank hierarchy before mother became before his mother became president. So that becomes uh, um, you know a professional who's doing his choir job. You know the rest of the other children, two other children, are in the private sector. You know, so that's what is called nepotism. So sometimes we don't even have the facts as to what we're talking about when we talk about them. Uh, talk about such things, you know. I thought, therefore, my point would be whatever we can do for the appropriate law to be done and passed, and everyone knows it and use it to this to 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 judge, then we'll be able to do that. We don't, and when we don't have that yet, too too bad. We'll continue to be talking as we are, and no one will be prosecuted because it is so open. Re- corruption. I think the fact that we talk about it now shows the progress that our country is making. Because there are institutions that have been set up. I, in fact, the fact that every time we are talking about corruption, the fact that wherever people are, in the schools or in the wherever they are, they're talking about corruption itself is serving as a, as a mitigating uh, 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 action on those who are want to be corrupt. Um, again, we must ensure that the code of conduct is passed in the legislature so that we know what is meant by corruption, what it is meant by a violation, you know, what you do that constitutes corruption. Let it be very clear in the laws, you know, and not be left to the people that are appointed into positions as uh, officials uh, dealing with cor- corruption. In some jurisdictions, corruption is not just only about public officials. It is used to define just a number of moral behaviors in society. There are some things you just don't do. And we haven't reached that yet. All we talk about is only that there may be corruption in the government. And and this person, the person has a new pair of shoes, or he got a new car, or he probably got a new house, so he got to be corrupt, you know, that type of way. Again, in the human rights work that we all have fought for, we say we have to be careful on charges we put on anybody. Everybody has a right, you know, to their own defense, and if you say something about somebody, you should be ready to uh, do something about it. You should be ready to stand uh, before the courts if, if the person decides to take, take it up with you. This is not to say that there are no corrupt practices. I'm saying some of those practices 
are happening because we haven't been able to define them sufficiently and our institutions are still very weak to, to pursue those things, to make sure that it's able to do a thorough investigation and have all the facts available for a given person to be prosecuted. You know, so that's part of the problem we have. You know. Thank you. Thank you, Abouza. Thank you for the deliberation. I'll take the next call of 6327-6327. Would you please tell us your name, where you're calling from, and your question for our community, Abouza, 6327. 6327. Yeah, 6327. Dennis? Are you there? Dennis. Ja, Dennis. Dennis, Ja. 6327, are you there? Yeah. Yeah, what's your Hello? question? Where, where, where are you calling from? Your full name? Where are you calling uh, from? Your question for the minister. Okay, my name is Dave. Dave, Jeff. And I, I'm calling from Philadelphia. Okay. Are Welcome you, to the show. Me? What's your question for the minister? Yeah, what's your question? Oh. Go ahead. Okay, uh, my my first first I uh, just to make a reference uh, to what the minister said concerning uh, the TRC uh, that uh, is that they, it was a violation of the constitution. My point in that direction also, uh, and he referred to all that has been going on has just a uh, bunch of talking. But my, what I would like to say also, if we have an institution that is that is charged with the responsibility to interpret whether any provision or any conduct in the country is unconstitutional, I think it's the court system that has to define that that you know that that will become the intervening uh, uh, force in the country. And so in the absence of that, I think that is also uh, uh, um, w then we're just talking. So if if there is an institution, if there is, was the court that de that deems the TRC uh, recommendations as unconstitutional, I think that interpretation, that particular thing, it should become the, 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 the prerogative of the court to decide whether it is unconstitutional or not. And at the same time, um, if... if Countries, institutions. We set up institutions to to do recommendations, to make investigations, and not every recommendation that will be made has to be in keeping with the constitution because the constitution is just a framework. Yeah. There are some institutions that we may set up, and 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 those institutions are just there to what supplement the work of the constitution. So again, my point is. If this is a violation of the Constitution, I think it should have been left with the court to decide whether it is truly constitutional. So if, if just a group of people would just, I mean, would get up and say it's unconstitutional, therefore we should not even pay attention to the TRC recommendations, then that itself, it, I think it's a violation of the Constitution as well. So it should be the court that would Thank decide you. that. Uh, my, next thing, my next point, sir, my next point, sir, is, is regarding, you know, um, uh, when when the Ellen government took power, we expected a lot of, I mean, some reforms to take place in the country. But as I see it right now, I think it's it, it's just a, it's a continuation of the old of the old uh, things that used to happen. For instance, you know, my impression is that resources are not being channeled to the bottom, you know, of the uh, to the bottom. That is to empower the Liberian people to help them especially the various counties. But instead, what I, 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 I notice is that we continue to just convolute, convolute uh, the, the, the whole Morovia group. You set up okay. ministries upon ministries, agencies upon agencies that are all, most of them predominantly based in the capital city when the interior of the country is left with nothing. And so I, I, I will expect your comments on those uh, on this point, Mr. Minister. Okay, okay. Before, before the minister comes, when, when the last time you visited Liberia, sir? When was the last time you were in Liberia? It, is, is, it, is, is it relevant? Well, it's relevant. If you think it's a continuation of the past, yes. I'm assuming that you must have... Uh... Oh, they, they have I, I'm talking about structural reforms, but I'm constantly okay. in right. charge with Liberia. My last time I was in Liberia was in 2009. 
and I'm okay. constantly in Liberia. I have a bunch of families. I have friends. I have children in Liberia. So I'm deeply rooted and attached to Liberia. I talk okay. Okay. on a regular basis thank with you. my village. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Let me just comment. Thank you. Oh, oh, uh, okay. Hello? Hello? Yeah, hello. Uh, go ahead. Go ahead. The floor is yours. Go ahead, sir. Okay. Well, let me let me thank you, David, um, for your comments. But again, that brings us to some of the issue of, of, of how we how we understand things. Uh, in the first instance, you talk about constitution. You give it. You give. You are saying that some things that laws or actions there are some that should not be or may not be constitutional. But anything that is not constitutional is wrong. That's the first thing. So don't even go there. The only time when we said we suspended the Constitution as a way of ending the war, that brought Liberians together with international support, and it was declared to everybody that we are going to suspend this session of the Constitution. But come on the 6th of January, come this day, when new government or uh, well not say that when the new government is inducted into office in 2006, uh, uh, um, uh, the constitution will come into full force. Now, how can you go around that and say you can set up something and say uh, sometimes they're there to support the constitution and may not be constitutional? So you're starting from a wrong premise. You got to go back to the to the law. The constitution is the supreme law, David. So don't talk about that again. You're too educated to say that. Don't repeat it to somebody again. It's very wrong. You must only do the thing. The overarching law is the Constitution. Anything else that anybody does that is against the Constitution is wrong. It's declared unconstitutional. The second thing about law, I just told you that the issue of the PRC recommendation, that one recommendation regarding... Um, you know, banning people for 30 years and this and that, was taken to the Supreme Court. It was the Supreme Court that decided in our country and in the United States where you are, the Supreme Court is the final arbiter of the law in our country. Or any dispute, the Supreme Court is the final arbiter. The Supreme Court decided that the PRC was wrong in what they did in the case of uh, Yancey. And no, I'm say sorry. Uh, uh, in the case of uh, Archie Williams, you know, Archie Williams took this matter to court. And the Supreme Court concluded unanimously that they were wrong in that recommendation. So who else do you want to say that they were wrong before you believe it? So, I mean, on that one, again, please, maybe you have not picked up the facts. You say you, you, your children there, you yourself going there back and forth. But you're, not all the people who there follow the development in, in Liberia, you know. Uh, all of us, some of us there, even some people in the government, very senior officials, they don't, they don't pay attention to some details, you know. But the law, the Supreme Court decision is final. It's law. By the time the Supreme Court makes that decision, it's law. So go to it, yeah. If you want, I'll be able to send you. I, I think I can send you even the ruling of the you where you can find the ruling. The other question you, you, you mentioned um, about, about no change, you know, the same way Moravia Group setting up institutions and stuff, you know, and nothing going to the country. Well, again, you know, um, I wish that you come from uh, Sino, or if, 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 if I'm correct, you know, uh, then uh, you should ask. In the whole Liberian history, we didn't have something called county development funds where a certain portion of our budget is immediately set aside from the national budget, right from the passage of the budget, to be administered, and it doesn't matter the size of the county. Each county, Montserrado and River G, get the same amount on that county development fund. There is also the, the, the social fund, um, the, the, the one that come from the uh, 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 corporations that operate in our country, in our county, you know, this time they're supposed to contribute a certain portion 
of what they earn and giving to the local people, giving to the local authorities to implement development in the county. That didn't happen before. I mean, that's one way in which we are ensuring the development at times. Now, if you say, let the people in Morovia, that conversation sounds like really old times, really, really old in time conversation because the people you call Maria people now, that are me, that are ja, that are the other, you go look in the whole legislature, who they come up with it? Who the Maria people there? The, even the representatives of Montserrat County, people who are representatives of Maria, every single, hardly, there is not a single one, I think there were two or three people who actually were original uh, inhabitants of, of, of Montserrat. They come from Grand School, Sino, uh, River G, all of them. They are the two who are elected as representatives from, from Montserrat now. So what do you want to know that your own people are there? Instead of holding our own brothers and sisters responsible to ensure that the benefits of our, the things that we're talking about go down to our people, you are complaining as if you are talking about a different type of people. And, and, and you know, David, let's be honest. We've got to be serious. We can't be talking like this, you know. Have you asked the people from Sino, who are they, the, the representatives from Sino, the senators, any government among them? They're not the same type, uh, what they call them, crew, repo, and tapotere? Have you asked them that the things we're crying for for our people, are you ensuring that they reach to Bubadi and all of those places? And you're complaining about people in Morovia? No, man, please. That type of conversation, not to me. Thank you. <coughs> Hello? 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 Sorry if you're on the line. I, I'm not hearing you. Hello? Hello? Welcome on. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. Welcome yeah. on. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, can you hear you? Me? Yeah. I just wanted. So, what is the minister still on, Minister Wusa? Well, I'm just now getting back because I lost the few, last few minutes yeah. or two or three yeah, minutes. What? We, we were hearing you, though. We are hearing you. That's why I kept saying, say, we're hearing you. Well, I'm glad okay. we, we are all back together. All right. Okay. And I, I'm, glad all right. We, I'm glad we are all back together. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll let you let you offer this soon here. I know you, you were tight on time. You did talk about that. So we'll, we'll, yeah. we'll, uh, we'll tell you uh, lose pretty soon here. But in the meantime, yeah. let's continue with the question. Say I'll get back to you with a follow-up question. Stay where you are. Let me take some some new callers here. Uh, 5500 Could you please tell us your name, where you're calling from, and your question for the Honorable Minister? Uh, this is Asumana Jabate from New York. Uh, it is not a question. Uh, it, it is just a statement. Uh, Minister, we said, I just want to say it was an honor to have your son participate in our summer program in Liberia. Mm -hmm. But here's what happened. Uh, on a trip to Kakata, BWR, mm -hmm. we got in a situation that needed discussion. At the end of the discussion, he made a proposal. I would like to make that proposal to mm -hmm. you so that you can probably take, take it to the higher up. Mm -hmm. 
The proposal was in reference to rare light. Mm -hmm. We had the most difficult time in getting through rare light. Mm -hmm. And then the question was thrown to them. And I said, now, do we have a problem? He said, yes. He was one of those that said, we have a problem in getting through. Then the question was, how do we solve it? This was your son's answer. And the answer was that when we are building the next road, we should build it around, make a one-way around red light to cover mm -hmm. the whole entire red light, and only there should be a one-way exit a right as a out of rare light. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was a nice proposal. Instead of having two-way traffic going through rare light, we should make a one-way circle around rare light. And today I heard that the, there's a $50 million construction uh, for Somali drive that go towards red line. Mm -hmm. So can you consider that proposal from your son? I'm not going to call his name on this line, but if you mm -hmm. get a chance to talk with him, uh, you can discuss it further with him. But I think it's a great proposal. So okay. whoever you want to discuss that way, that's fine. Thank you. Well, let me quickly say, that a lot of thinking has been going into the the um the rail light issue. Uh and again, you know, the younger the better. You younger people keep thinking about various ways to make it better for themselves. So this is something where we're thinking through. But if you know at the moment what is happening is that there is from somewhere from Duper Road there's a road now that is being and, and I was shocked, I mean pleasantly surprised the other day. There's a road now that goes all the way behind to what they call the Gubachev market and I mean the structures are being broken and it's a paved road. So you you'll be surprised, you just jump on that road before you realize it, you've gone beyond uh, red light. Then you have um the other one that comes from Somalia Drive that goes all around again, going to almost to uh, Coca-Cola factory. So there are roads now that are there that are reducing the traffic in red light. And when the work is done, that road from red light to, to Ganta, from red light to Banga to Ganta, when that road is done, I think it will contribute immensely to the market, to that traffic congestion. And then the market is being removed to where you have uh, the Omega, where the Omega Tower used to be. The new market is under construction. The intention is to move a lot of the markets and leave shops in the red light area so that, you know, people can do easy transactional business in the Omega area. So, you know, there are some things that are on the way as we speak. The Somalia Drive Road, um, I, I took part in the negotiations in Tokyo. Uh, and we will be very pleased to have the dual carriageway that will be done on that, that will change that road um, from Somalia Drive to the Japanese Liberia Friendship uh, Boulevard. It's going to be a, a big, nice street like uh, Broad Street. You know, that's about about what it's going to be, and potential for expansion. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. We'll, t we'll take some follow-up questions here, and then we'll take a few new ones. Uh, as I said, we'll not keep you here any longer than you wish to be, and we do want to respect your request for a limited time. I believe all these people have make, asked questions before, but we let's take some uh, Sam. Sam, welcome back to LeBron Diaspora Forum. Yes, uh, Brother Kuma, thank you so much. This will be my last return. I just wanted to piggyback on the minister's session about the laws and, you know, the implementation of TRC, why the Supreme Court uh, denied, I mean, the Supreme Court is the Supreme Court of the of the land, which is true. 
But one thing I just want to bring for the listening audience uh, 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 attention, maybe they already know, the composition of, this, uh, of the current Supreme Court was constituted by this very president who herself is indicted within the CTRC report. Uh, it could be argued, again, it could be argued that that could be another reason why you think the Supreme Court will be more sympathetic to the president than to the report itself. Having said that, let me close on this. I think the general uh, uh, session by the, by the minister, I, I think to some extent, uh, is somewhat questionable when you talk about his role and being uh, one of the authors of the law that, 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 that brought to, to light this very TRC. It's true. But what is also true is that I think overall it is the, it, it is the explicit lack of political will on this part of this current government Headed by this president, who himself is also indicted or accused or allegedly involved in the very war that destroyed our people. So one would think that it's on, it's on think of, it's unheard of to, to, to think that in, 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 in this current Liberia, a sitting president will be indicted, the president that constituted a very committee, and this same committee will turn around and indict this president. So it's just unheard of. So that's why this. This TRC report has been so heated and debated. Let me close on this. He said uh, people like Dill Mason did not appear or, did, uh, or they didn't call him. I think in all fairness to all librarians, including myself, who were very passionate and worked on the TRC in, in the diaspora, it was an open forum for all librarians. So if Dill Mason was accused, I think it, one, one would think that it would have been fair for Dill Mason to go to the TRC then, then waiting for TRC to call him. The TRC was an open forum for all librarians who have something to say. So if people that did military did not appear, that doesn't mean that, that the TRC implementation, I mean, recommendations should not be implemented. It's just a lack of political will. That's what I would say. So it's nothing about so much of the law or the constitution because the very president violated the Liberian constitution when she held finance a war that destroyed over 250,000 people. So where was the constitution at the time? When she said level, level Moravia. So they talk about constitution, you. you know, I mean, I think it's just unfair to, 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 to us. Thank you Good. so much. Let's leave it. Thank you. Hello. I mean, sorry I didn't get the name, but... Um, uh, uh, I'm Seyon. Seyon Nyongwe. Seyon Nyongwe. Okay. Yeah. Sounds, sounds, right. sounds uh, very eloquent, but when you're wrong, you're wrong. No matter how eloquent you are. Now, you're giving... You're giving examples about appointments and stuff. I don't want to go into that. Are you saying that when the Constitution says that President Obama should appoint the court, is it, and therefore you believe that the court she, he will appoint will not carry out its duties because that court has been appointed? But the, all the other things you're talking about, anti-corruption commission, the Constitution provides the appointment to be done by the president. The president so elected carries out that duty. But if you go far of the law, in this country, in this United States that you are, it has taken effect. In Liberia, it has taken effect where people who have violated the law, and that's why, especially young people like you, you don't just get up and make a statement. I mean, it's, it's, I, I feel bad sometimes when you get up and use cliché. Uh, is a political will, and there's that, and then you go and sit down. What is the meaning of that? What is the meaning of you saying that people should just woke up? I mean, wake up and go to the TRC, and when they when they when they accuse you, then you wake up, you go to the TRC and talk. Do you know the process that that was required with the few members of the TRC? So every citizen who yeah yeah their name on the radio, they go and walk somewhere and start talking. Didn't they have a forum? That they, they invited people. You don't know that. When you, if you say you work on the TRC process, if you know that, why would you say something like that? You know, I mean, don't this. I, I feel bad for people of the intelligence that you have, some of you, that you just talk things that you know don't make a lot of sense. Because I know how it works. You know that, that you get an invitation. When you get an invitation, you are giving time. And this thing is recorded. You come there. Mr. Mason, you, using the case of Mason, he was invited. The man made himself available. He wrote at one point and said, I'm out of the country. I live out of the country. You gave me two days' notice. 
I need to come, get a ticket to come, to be present. He comes, they say, oh, no, we are not ready for you at this time. Two, three times, nothing happened. The next thing, a report comes and says he's not guilty. Then you say, he's supposed to get me inside a label. Is that how you work? Is that how the TRC part you work on? Is that what the procedure was? So please, let's be careful. So uh, the president points, that's why the, the court cannot do anything about it. So you're going to go to heaven and bring people to be on the Supreme Court. My friend, if you become president today, you will appoint the Supreme Court if there is a vacancy on that court. Just like uh, Obama is appointing court officials, it might just be the next president might not even have the opportunity, you know, to appoint because there might be no vacancy on the on the bench. If there is a vacancy and it falls for you, it falls within your purview as president at that time. You will do your work. Let's do the thing that is consistent with law. You talk as if you have no respect for constitution. Just because you have a point of view. And I can tell you, between you and myself, I will always choose the Constitution. I will. Because we have seen where lawlessness has carried us. You said the things you said during war. When people did this, they supported this war here and there and this, that. But we said that was wrong. We say everybody who is so angry, and the way you sound very angry, I, I pray that you use your anger wisely and within the means, within the provisions of the law, within the provisions of the Constitution. Because Liberians would never anymore, Liberians are not ready for people who want the unconstitutional means to effect whatever disagreement they have. I just want to encourage you, young men, and wherever you are, each of us, if you are in the United States, having fun, continue having fun. But that country, the rest of us are dedicating ourselves to ensuring that we will continue to sustain our peace and no angry person, nobody is going to lead us down the path of any, any destruction again. Please believe that and, and work along with others in that regard. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Prime Minister. Uh, that will bring us to our next caller, 9648-9648. Your question, your name, where are you calling from? Your question for the Honorable Minister, 9648. Hi, my name is Isaac. I'm calling from Minnesota. Uh, My question for the Honorable Minister, uh, well, Mr. Minister, I'm not so eloquent like the previous callers, but I have a question for you. And I'm so happy that you stated that you believe and respect the Constitution. But the Constitution of Liberia is clearly stipulated in Article 5 that the, the President and the House of Legislature should put into place law to prevent nepotism. But I want you, Mr. Speaker, I mean, Mr. Minister, since I'm not that educated, what's the definition of nepotism? If what is taking place in Liberia does not amount to, to nepotism, then what is your definition? for nepotism. Are you having different definition just because you are serving the president? No, my brother. Please. Thank you, Mr. Please. Harris. Are you done? Yeah, yep. Mr. My, my right. brother. Thank you, Mr. Harris. Let me, yeah. yeah, let me say to you, the way we we'll avoid confusion is for us to use what is an agreeable definition by all, not my individual definition, all right? Um, I want the legislature, and I don't know what part of the Constitution you read that said the president and the legislature. It is the legislature under the Constitution that makes, that will take the Constitution and make laws that make the legislation from the thing. So what the president does for the law to come into force is for the president to sign it. But the legislature has that duty. What the president has done has been to make a recommendation. They send uh, draft legislation to the legislature. And this thing has been with the legislature for the last four years. It hasn't happened. Now, if you have a person in the legislature, if you have a constituency 
I mean, if you're part of a constituency that is represented in the legislature, then get your legislature and say, the law that the government sent to you, the cabinet approved and sent to you, where is it? We want you to pass it so that we all have a common de- definition of these things, including corruption, including uh, uh, um, uh, what they call it, nepotism. And you are asking me to define it, so when I define it, my son define it, my sister define it, and each of, then the whole day, confusion. I don't, don't take me down that route. All right? And I don't want your definition, too. Thank you. Hello? Thank you. Thank you. I'm here. Thank you, Mr. Minister. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Uh, thank you. We'll take the next call out here. Uh, 0488. Would you please tell us your name? Where are you calling from? Your question for the Honorable Minister. 0488. Uh. My name is Abdullah Dukla. I'm calling from Columbus, Ohio. Welcome to the show, Mr. Dukla. Yeah, hi. Uh, I'll be very brief. In, uh, uh, Mr. Minister, thank you very much for what all you have said. Uh, I'm not going to be too political. I was just, I'm just talking about developmental issue here. The, the Ghana Bay Somalia Drive Highway, you touched that uh, when you guys went to Tokyo and... Uh, you discuss certain stuff and drafted some stuff that would be very nice for the country. So my question is that because I'm eager, I've been living in Ghana all my life, and uh, that project has been on the whole when we were very, very small at a younger age. So I'm very eager to know the time frame, whether it's a short-term project or it's another long-term project again that we are about to see. So thank you. Well, I mean, I'm telling you, we started the negotiation. The Minister of Public Works and the Japanese government, they're going to be signing the agreement, the, 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 the drawings and all of this stuff. The important thing is that the Japanese government, including the last visit of the president, have made a commitment that they will do that project. So it's approved, and they are, bring, they are approving the drawings. We want a modern dual carriage road. So it's going to be solid road that will take the heavy trucks because that is a road that will be going to the freeport. So it's going to be more modern, I mean, according to Japanese standards. So uh, my understanding is uh, that I think between now and August that um, the drawings will be approved, will be, the signing will take place and, and all of that. And then the next stage is for the funding to be made available. You know, so that's road, building road and solid road takes some time. And I'm sure this pro- this project is going to begin the the next rain season, uh, the dry season, you know, uh, at the beginning this year. Thank you. Thank you, Roman Minister. Yeah. Uh, Jai is back. Probably for a quick follow-up question. 6327. Uh, your follow-up question for the Minister of Quickness, 6327. Dennis? Dennis, 6327. Oh, Minister, you hear me? Yes, I can hear. Okay, so maybe Dennis must not be by his phone. So if you just join us, we are well over. We just got, uh, we got less than 30 minutes left of uh, tonight's program. We've had the extreme pleasure of hosting the Honorable Minister of State with our portfolio, Honorable Community B. Wissa. So he's speaking on various issues of uh, national concern. So if you haven't had your chance to talk, ask questions, uh, this is the time. Please dial star 61 on your phone, or you may test your question to 612-203-3820. So I think Dennis is back. He just uh, left to re-enter. S- 6327. Hello? Uh, hello? Are you yes, on? Yes. Yes, I'm here. Okay. Uh, what's your follow-up question for the minister? Quickly. Okay. Uh, I mean, not really not a follow-up question per se, but a clarification. When I okay. spoke about, you know, when I spoke about not, you know, Making Morovia bloated with all of these ministers and deputy ministers, I was not making reference about Congo or indigenous. That wasn't my point. 
So I would like for the minister to, I mean, to have that understanding as well. That was not the point when I spoke about Morovia being bloated with all of these uh, ministers, deputies, public corporations. I was making specific reference about how large Morovia government, I mean, the government in Morovia has become and neglecting the interior of the, of, of, of the country. But I was not making any specific reference regarding, I mean, making the equivalent of Morovia to Congo people and then to indigenous in the, in the interior park. So I would like for the minister to have that, you know, to have that. I, I want to make that clarification. My point is that if we make Morovia government a little bit smaller, I mean, the people, most of the ministry is smaller, and then we deploy a lot of people in the interior where people need to work and then support the economy of the country, I think it will serve the country better. If we have more people, more work, more, you know, people earning income in the various counties that, and make Morovia a little bit smaller, with even some of the talented people in Morovia being deployed in the county, is going to help the country. In my view, it will help the country elevate it from the bottom, and then it will support, you know, the, 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 the central government and then all other development projects. That was my point. It wasn't about Congo or about, you know, indigenous. So when the minister was talking about whether someone comes from Sino, comes from this, and from this part, I mean, that was not the trend that I was taking. So basically okay. how we can empower the interior, because the better we have in interior, the more people working in the various counties, it, it, it makes Liberia to function better than what we have right so, now so, or what so we have been having for the past year. So, 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 it sounds like you would like to see the central government more decentralized and like, uh, open up some ministry in Leeward counties. Is that what you say? Um, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. And, okay. and if that doesn't change, I think we are still going through the same old process with this huge Monrovia government, huge presidential power with nothing left for the people okay. so that they can have an, uh, All right. Let's, let, let's give the minister okay. a chance to come in. Your point is worth taking. Thank you. No, All right. Let me. I, I, I think when you introduced the gentleman, you said it was David. I know there is a David Jar and a Dennis Jar, so I don't know which of them is uh, was asking this the is, question. This is Dennis Jar. Dennis Jar. Okay. Now, okay. So, um, the the issue of um, the issue of decentralization, the issue of smaller government and big government. You know, these are issues, I'm sure, in the United States, which is a big issue of debate. It continues. It's, it's, all, it's an issue that continues. You will always have ministries, central, that are central ministries located in the capital city. You will not get up one morning and make the Ministry of Agriculture go and sit down in Accra or Public Works in Cape Palmas. It's not going to happen. You will always have ministers in the capital city. You will have... Uh, heads of agencies in the capital city. That's why it is called capital city. Now, um, now when we say that the way to, there are forms of decentralization and devolution, which can be, uh, can be done. And I think we should, we, should, we should continue the debate. And one of the ways, again, is our legislators that we have the constituencies we come from, we'll talk to our legislators and say to them, look, this is what we, the people you're going to, especially now, 2014 election will come. So those, those people you're going to support to get to become senators and think, you will say, we want emphasis on decentralization. And this is the way we think development will come to uh, rural areas. So that is not only a matter of uh, the president, as you know, the decentralization proposals have been made. They are under discussion. The, the law has been, I think, it's already been submitted to the legislature. You know, uh, it's a, see, I, I've taken part in the discussion, and we have representatives from around the country taking part in those discussions. It is not an easy discussion. The more is discussed, the more people believe that same thing needs to be at the center to get something moving in the rural areas. But that's not a bad idea. I've 
I mean, to, to talk so about. Ad, ad, additionally, the Honorable Minister, isn't it true that that process itself has begun? I mean, we've had, we've hosted many lawmakers here, and they've told us that for the first time in the history of Liberia, uh, they now have, they've, they've all decided to open uh, local offices uh, in their various areas of uh, that uh, is right. Sequence. Right. So uh, uh, I know that Senator, is right. Joy How- Senator Joy Howard Taylor told us, told us that on this show, Senator Groupie did, and uh, Representative Dona and a bunch of them too, and they've, they've started doing that. So I think yeah. that's, uh, that's the right step in the right direction. We are we're getting there. We'll take the next caller here, uh, 8904, 8904. Your name, where are you calling from? And your question for the Honorable Minister, 8904. Hello? Hello, go ahead. Hello, 8904. Your name, where are you calling from and your question? Hello, are you there? 215? Hello? Can anybody hear me? Hello? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, so I see the eighty-nine zero four must not. Eighty-nine zero four, are you there? Yeah. Hello. Oh, okay, come back when you're ready. I'll come back. I will close the line. I will go to thirty-eight sixty-one. I believe it's a follow-up caller. Three eight six one. Would you please tell us your name again? A follow-up question for the honourable minister. Thirty-eight uh, sixty-one. Again. This is Harry C. Mann of Richfield, Minnesota. Uh, I just want to make a quick comment on the TRC issue. Uh, in as much as I like Brother C. I, I mean, I, I tend to kind of differ with him on that issue. And I think that the Honorable Minister is right. Uh, recommendations are not, they are not cut in stones like laws. And if recommendations are made, I, you know, I understand Senator's point. I personally would like to see some of the warlords be punished, whether, whether they're in office or when they're out of office. But the TRC made recommendations, and those recommendations must, must be turned into law to be implemented. So I don't see any way that making recommendations will put us under the notion that they are law and gospel and they should be implemented. You know, so I personally don't see that. I want to thank the minister for his time, and that's all I want to say to him. You know, uh, but we say thank you so much for taking the time to come. I wish just to say hi to you. God bless you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Harris. And I do want to add my own verse to that. I do want to thank the minister for going out of his way to, to speak with us tonight. Uh, we got we got about just barely 18 minutes left of tonight's program. So once again, if you haven't had a chance to ask your question, make your comment, or express your concern, now is the time. We'll be out of here before you know it. So we'll take uh, 8904 is back. 8904. Could you please tell us your name, where you calling from, and your question for the honourable minister? 8904. Yeah. Good evening. My name is Shiniki Akumala. I'm calling from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Good evening, Mr. Welcome, Minister. Mr. Yeah, thank you. Good evening. Yeah, I, I have um, a very simple question for you. Uh, I'd like to say thank you for coming on the line tonight. Um, from time, Maria, um, Liberia, we all know, is our home, and we all love this country. But um, I know back in the 80s, the late door was doing some construction of some ministries in Morovia. And um, when the war broke out, all those projects was put a heart. And I left Liberia the last time I visited that uh, was 2009. And when I went there, I actually saw some of those structures and uh, they were still, you know, be on touch. I want to know what kind of plans you people have to, you know, complete some of those projects, like the new defense ministry he was building in Concord Town. You know, the new health ministry that he was building over there, too. I mean, these are nice buildings, and the, 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 the national bank that he was constructing right um, somewhere around the Broad Street area. I mean, these buildings are very good for the city. 
And uh, up to this time, I mean, I don't know whether you people have done anything about it. I'm happy about the construction of road that you talk about. Uh, these are something that I am really concerned about. That's one. Two, a um, few months ago, I overheard something about some conflict between the superintendent of Monserrado County and one other representative over there. Um, I really wanted you to throw light on that issue as to how far it gone, because I don't know, I'm, I'm very much aware that you are not in the um, legislative branch of government, uh, but I believe that you might have some knowledge as to you know, how far that issue went. But I'd like to tell you my personal feeling regarding that issue. Um, I understand the superintendent recorded the, 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 the honorable voice illegally uh, on going to the honorable, but the fact that the honorable was doing something that was not right, why you think the superintendent should suffer this? This is the reason I personally believe Liberia is now going nowhere. Liberia is our home and we love this country, but people continue to, I mean, do things just to suffer the poor people in the country. I mean, you misuse the public phone if you went to somebody and asked the person. I'm not saying that he did it, but this is the allegation that was made. You went to somebody to, to, to ask the person to divide the money that was given to her for the county, and the person refused because of that, and you start to, you know, bounce you and telling the person that the person should be fired and what have you, and the person came out and recorded your voice on knowing to you. Because of this, you want the person to be fired? Why would the Liberian people sit aside and see things like that happen? One person will suffer the country? I don't think this is right, and this is the reason why Liberia is going back war. Liberia is the least country in the world today. We are five, five by our other country. And I think Thank, we you. Should go Thank you. Thank you. Minister. Yeah, but quickly, let me thank you. But let me start with the the issue of uh, uh, projects that do left behind and what is happening to them. Let's start with the Ministry of Defense. The old ministry, the Ministry of Defense. Uh, my last, the last time that I uh, inquired the information from the Ministry of Public Works, if I am correct, was that the building was not good enough to be used, to be completed. You know, um, there are serious uh, structural flaws, so it wouldn't be able to, uh, they cannot complete it. There is, uh, the, the, one of the things that the Chinese are trying to do is to build, uh, is uh, taking account of some of those uh, issues of some ministries. The national bank that you're talking about, you should come and see what it looks like. A huge construction is going on. Lovely building going up. It's, uh, it's going to be ready. I'm not quite sure when it's going to be ready, but you will love it. So far, it's taking shape, and it's beautiful. The Ministry of uh, Health is now being occupied by the Ministry of Health. It was completed by the Chinese government, and it is now being occupied. It's a majestic structure. Beautiful. Absolutely lovely. You, you will love it. So, you know, just to say that some, some of the projects are on the way. Some are not on the way, you know, um, because there are other things that are happening with the limited resources that the government has to deal with and the number of friends who are available to assist us. Now, the question you raised regarding the issue of what happened between uh, Superintendent Grace Ma and and the um, the four. yeah four, you know, uh, the, it, it has all manner of uh, implications, uh, imp uh, yeah, dimensions, and I'm not going to go into all of those issues. What I do know is that uh, the action that was taken against uh, Superintendent Ma was what was interpreted as her. Um, you know, disrespect of the legislature. So a lot of pressure came to bear, and they, and she resigned under that pressure, you know. But it, it did not mean that the issue uh, about whether she legally recorded or whether the, what, the, what the 
legislators said uh, constituted evidence of corruption and all of that, that is a matter which I, unfortunately, I do not have any details about at the moment. You know, but uh, I'm sure uh, we, we, I'll check on that to know where it is standing. But you have to first establish that a crime has been committed. As you say, it is alleged, it is this, it is that. No investigation has happened to, to the best of my, or conclusively has happened. Maybe investigation in the legislature has been going on, but uh, I don't think uh, the reports have been uh, given yet. Okay. Uh, I'll just I'll give you my last test uh, test message question here, and then uh, I will just take uh, two of these follow up callers together, and then you can begin your closing remark uh, and address those two callers concerned, if that's okay with you, sir. The test message question reads: uh, as, a former, as a former member of the National House of Legislature. What do you think of the term of uh, uh, various offices in Liberia? The term of uh, uh, presidency, five years. Is it five, five years term? I thought it was six. And then nine years term for senators. What do you think about that? Uh, and those too many years for one person to be in, in position without election? Do you support uh, the term of office of the president, uh, the senators, or do you think otherwise? Well, I've, I've taken part in a number of discussions, and we're still debating the issue. Um, I probably would need to hold my personal opinion on this matter. Uh, however, I may say, I should be able to say that uh, nine years is quite a long time, but I'm not one of those who think that we should just go and follow the American uh, thing with four years for president and think, you know, the press preparing elections, as I have found, you know, is a whole is 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 very conflictual, and because of the underdevelopment of our of our institutions, you know, you can't just call it snap election for every time a whole lot of preparation, a lot, a lot of resources get wasted, and all of that. So we might need to look at. Uh, uh, the presidential term, but certainly four years is not one of my yeah, choices. Nine years for senators, I think, is a little too long. You know, some adjustments need, need to be made. Thank you. Folks, we are almost at the very end of uh, tonight's program. And uh, as usual, if you like to listen to repeat broadcasts of tonight's program, uh, the 559-726-1299 and the same access code 9082. Zero nine, followed by the pound sign. At least for now, between now and Sunday, until I can have time to upload the show on YouTube, just like many of our other uh, previous shows. So I'll take the last two callers. Uh, they are interesting that they are both follow-up callers. Uh, I ask that you first keep it brief, and then uh, we'll allow the minister to make his closing remark, including your concerns uh, within, your, within, your, uh, within your follow-up calls. I was saying, uh, Welcome back. Please keep it brief. We are at the very end here. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you so much, Brother Kroma. I just wanted to comment on what the minister said. I think he suggested that I was angry. And uh, if I may humbly say, I think it will be a fair assessment if he says so. And the reason I would say I would agree with the assertion is this. I'm angry because good people like you who have fought over the years to see that we have a better Liberia but today compromise the values for which he stood. I think it's troubling. So for that, if you say I'm angry, then I think I have the right to be angry. Because when people like you who suffer and fought hard for a better Liberia will compromise your position on issues that truly is meant to, 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 to move the country forward, and because you have found convenience within your position as government official, and so then you play a blind eye, to justice and allow impunity to be the order of the day, then of course we have right to be angry because this is not the kind of Liberia we hope for. This is not a Liberia for which over 250,000 people died for nothing. For us to say that and be and be an acceptance to say yes, impunity is the way forward. Mr. Minister, no, I'm not angry. I'm just disappointed that Liberia has not moved forward after bloodless civil war. That's all. But I'm not angry. Thank you. Thank you. I'll we'll take the next one here, and then uh, the minister will come with his closing remark. Uh, Dennis, Ja, Dennis, welcome back to the show. Uh, what's your final say? 
Dennis? Dennis, are you there? 6327. Yeah, what's your what's your final word? We are ju- just about to close here. Okay. Uh my final word is to thank the minister and then uh it was kind of um uh, my my point is that uh I learned a country like Botswana, Botswana I learned when they discovered diamond in the country there was a national conference and then the people came together and said this is what we're gonna do with our resource and we will build roads and houses for people. Um, since we learned that there has been the exploration of oil or the discovery of oil in Liberia, I would like for the minister, if he doesn't have the time, maybe it will be another time, but uh, has to, what are the, 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 the key projects that this oil resource will address? If, uh, I think uh, for me, if we commit most of the resources to the construction of roads and highways, solid ones, not the just improvised ones that will easily wash away. I think that will be a very good thing for the country. Um, and I thought there should have been a national conference to celebrate this kind of discovery that we have in Liberia so that the Liberian people will consider themselves as part and parcel of what is going on in their country, that their government is transparent to them. Uh, so that is that is my point. Uh, and the, so it's about the oil resources. I think it should be utilized wisely for the, I mean, for the advancement of our country. And my other point is about, you know, we, let's look at Liberia GDP because I think the more we continue to ask for aid, the less we will get investors in the country. You know, when people think, I mean, when investors believe that they can get the, the best benefit out of their investment in that particular country based on its own income and its GDP, I think most investors are going to go there. But the more we continue to ask for aid and aid, people will, may not take us so much seriously and may not want to invest in Liberia. Uh, those are my two final points. And thank, thank you, you very thank much, you. Mr. Minister, thank for allowing me to, you know, and then thank you, Mr. Moderator, for, your, for, for, for letting me in on me. Speak, uh, speak. My name is Dave Jar, not Dennis. Dennis is in Atlanta. I'm in Philadelphia. We must sound the Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Your, point, your points are well taken. Honorable right, Minister, the floor is yours mm. for your closing remark, uh, and possibly, you know, uh, uh, including uh, uh, commenting on those last two concerns, sir. All right. All right. Thanks for the clarification because I would have found it very strange because. Some, uh, I guess about an hour and a half ago, I, I saw Dennis, and then I was hearing that that Dennis was in Philadelphia. I say, well, since there are a couple of Dennis jars, maybe that's the other one there. <laughs> so I got it. I got the story now. Um, well, I think the point made uh, by uh, Mr. Ja, you know, is uh, worth further consideration. The issue of uh, discussing the um, yeah, what we're going to do for our development. Again, maybe again, the government is not sharing uh, a, a lot of the information. We do not pick up a lot of the information regarding some of the discussions that are taking place. If you heard about Vision 3030, uh, 2030 that had come around for Liberia to move to middle-income country, uh, there is the agenda for transformation and the roadmap for reconciliation. Those are development tools that have been uh, discussed and I, 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 uh, development directions that have been discussed and agreed upon. And so if you look at them, you will know that some of the things that people are talking about, about not only with the oil issue, but other parts of our res- other resources, they benefit there from uh, where we're going to commit them. That has been defined in the agenda for transformation. If you don't have a copy, you, I don't have the website now. I can re- give it to you. But just remember the name, Agenda for Transformation, and the, the Roadmap for Reconciliation, and uh, Vision 2030. That defined a number of things in that direction. Let me come to the, the, the young man um, who... Uh, said, oh, on the one hand, he's angry and he's not angry. He's the same gentleman that I met 
uh, not long ago uh, in in uh, in Atlanta, and I'm in in Minnesota. Then I would just say, you know, maybe you should find some time and let us talk, because talk is cheap. Talk is cheap. It's easy to accuse people and make all kinds of because, you know, you are not at all. I do not think you are qualified to judge me. You know, you need to you need to test, go through some tests and see whether or not. You know, you are the person that you say you are. You know, I'm not one of such people. I'm saying to you what I believe in. You have a problem with me believing in something? And you're saying to me, you want to judge me, that I'm saying the thing because I'm occupied government position? You know what I've, you know what I've been before? You know what, what I've seen? You know what tests I've gone through? I mean, you haven't gone through tests. You and you want to judge me? That's how you judge other people? And because you say so, it is right? And you say, I'm compromising? What have I compromised? What have I compromised about impunity? What, what is the meaning of the words you use? I mean, I'm, I, if you're the same gentleman I met before, very happy you went to school, and you need to go to school further, you know, and keep practicing, keep learning, Test the fire, and when you go through the fire, then you'll be able to say the things you say. But I can tell you, I have no compromise with impunity. I'm committed to ensuring justice. In fact, that's what I believe in. That's what I do all my life. That is why you can go wherever. You will not find my name associated with injustice. And because I believe in justice, it doesn't matter who. It can be whomever you call the warlord, the this and that. That person is entitled to justice. That is the system you're in. That's what you're taught to do in the United States that you love so much. No matter who you are, you hear there's a shooting out there, and you see the guy with the gun. They still gave him a trial. The police must produce evidence. It's difficult. It's painful. But that's what is called justice. And you better know that. Not because you hate somebody or disagree with them and you see, all you want is to see them dead. Then you don't belong to the realm of justice. You don't belong to the realm of those who believe in, in, in the future. And I know you've got a lot more wisdom than that. I want to encourage you. you got my number. Give me a call. I think you have a future. But it is not going to get any better for you if you're going to judge people just because they differ with you. Thank you. Well, to, thank end, you. to end this thank evening, yes. I just want to thank all of you who asked a wonderful question. I think we've got to continue this. When people in government or even outside government come and they offer themselves, you know, they offer because they think that we, we must go away from the past. We must be able to talk about our country. It doesn't mean being government does not give us the right knowledge for everything, but you do have some information that if you were not in government, sometimes you do not have. So when you ask me and I give you information, believe me, you know, but you also can use the information to go do further investigation. Don't say I'm doing it because I'm in government. In fact, I'm doing it because, precisely because I'm in government. It's part of my responsibility to inform. And the day I feel totally aggrieved, don't agree with the things that Ellen Johnson Salih is doing, I do not believe in this government. I will walk away. And those of you who know me know better. I have been out of government before. I have gone and paid a price for what I believe in. I don't just talk for the sake of it. I want to encourage all of us to keep doing this. This program is great. And the fact that you're doing it, you bring in knowledge, wisdom, and finding ways for our people, for people in the diaspora to participate in the, um, in the building of our national agenda. God bless all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Minister. Thank you for those uh, strong, powerful words of uh, closing remarks. Uh, 
Uh, once again, we do want to thank you so profoundly for taking up your time to speak with fellow Liberians all across America. Uh, we are truly honored. You are indeed uh, a true public servant, considering that you joined this show on the road. Uh, not a lot of people would do that. So we are grateful for doing so, and uh, we wish you well in your endeavor. Uh, we hope that you people will continue to make the right decision for Liberia. I do also want to thank all of our listeners tonight, the, all of you who came on the show. There are so many of you, uh, as always. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, like I said, uh, next week, Sunday, we'll have a group of Liberian lawyers on the show, headed by Councillor Jaro, that many of us happy to know in the diaspora. We'll be discussing dual citizenship. We encourage you to tune into that. On that note, uh, we want to end tonight's program here. The minister has uh, other engagements to go to. So my name is Kafuma Krama, as always, I'm your host, and we will leave it here. Thank you all, and do have a wonderful night. Thank you. Thank you.